Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for all of you that are going to take the time to watch the traffic safety student and family orientation. We are unfortunate that you were unable to join us, but we are glad that you're going to take the time to understand how traffic safety works in the Bellingham School District. I am Derek Hahn from COM High School. Um, I am going to lead us through this presentation. The beauty of traffic safety is Seahom, Bellingham, Options, and Squalicum, all of our Traffic safety classes operate very similarly because we all have to follow the same state laws, which we will talk about some of those state laws as they may be different from uh, previous traffic safety classes. If you're a seasoned parent or a family that has had traffic safety from an outside commercial school, um, and really the biggest difference is some of the traffic safety laws are a little bit different than just your normal high school um, class setup. Our agenda is to make sure that you know who your instructor is, make sure that we understand the graduated licensing process. We talk about the permit a little bit. If you already have your permit, that is fantastic. Thank you for following the steps and procedures that we have previously sent out, making sure that we understand the risks in associated with driving, making sure that your teen is ready, and then discussing how the teen family and teacher partnership works. We'll talk about some new laws. Organ donor is a required curriculum item, and then if you have any questions, I'll make sure that you know who to reach out for for those questions. So I said, I'm Derek Hahn. I'm at Seaham High School. Uh, this is currently our sixth year of offering traffic safety. Kurt Autumn is at Squalicum High School and Bree Ammerman is at Bellingham and Options. We all got trained in the same summer. We spent six weeks at Bellingham High School from eight to four, pretty much every day of the week, um, learning all the laws about traffic safety, getting um, course credit through Central Washington University so that we can assist your student in safe driving practices and helping to make Bellingham a safer place to live and commute. In our Bellingham Promise, there's many things that we talk about and really traffic safety just fit all right in there is that we want to make sure that every child has the opportunity to be productive in life and in the United States in Bellingham being able to drive a car having that opportunity and ability to get to and from places to and from work to soccer to and from any activity that is of interest of your student is going to be um, helping them out for success and so as there are many classes that they take all throughout their high school career, all valuable and important, we feel that traffic safety is one of those classes that will be hopefully most valuable and hopefully they find between Bree, Kurt and I, whoever their instructor is, that um, it's something that is a long lasting memory of class safe driving so that we can continue to improve the safety on our roads in Bellingham and the state of Washington. For traffic safety, there's a few things that we have to have. First, before class starts, all students must be 15 years old. Um, if a student wants to get their permit before they're in the class, but since everyone is in the class, uh, this usually does not apply. But for those parents, families that have younger children and thinking about it, um, if they can't get into a class right when they turn 15 or in kind of that window, uh, students can also get a permit at 15 and a half. They just have to take a knowledge test before they're able to get the permit. Um, because you're all in traffic safety, that knowledge test is waived until you finish traffic safety. The knowledge test is part of the licensing requirement to actu actually obtain your driver's license, which your student will be provided the opportunity to take the knowledge test at the end of the course. Um, the learner stage is six months, regardless of age. Uh, the only time the age does not matter for the six month learner stage is if a child turns 18. Uh, required supervision, uh, 50 hours of practice, 10 of which is at night. There are nighttime restrictions that you can't drive between the hours of 1 and 5 a.m. There's also restrictions on who that supervised driver is. Um, it should be somebody that has at least five years of driving experience, typically 21 to 25 or older. When we're driving with aunt, uncle, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, right, most of those conditions are easily met. And so that is for every family to make sure to get accomplished. There's a lot of different ways you can track it. Your drivers, uh, when you go to the take your skills test, they will ask the parent or guardian, whoever is there accompanying them, have they finished their 50 hours? You check a box, you sign it. Uh, Road Ready is an app that students can have on their phone that can track their time. Um, people 
keep a note in their phone. They write it down in a journal. However, they keep their time. It's just nice to know that you're getting those 50 hours in. And 50 hours is just the minimum. If students can get more than 50 hours, that's just going to help to create a safer driver. As when students are supervised by an adult in the car, the likelihood of a collision is extremely low. Once students turn 16, they've had their learner's permit for six months. They've passed all the tests they need to pass to get their license. They're on what's called an immediate driver's license. Their passenger restrictions, six months is the most common one. Uh, people know that they cannot carry any passengers unless they're immediate family. Um, they cannot have more than three passengers under the age of 20. Um, all of those things are things that as your teen is getting to their driver's license that they will want to make sure to know and they'll want to make sure that they are following and helping them follow with their accountability. The permit process is probably the most important part of tonight is making sure that everybody has a permit. By law, students can obtain the permit without taking the knowledge test. Like we said, they're all enrolled in traffic safety and that is what allows students to get their permit. By state law, we have a window that is 10 days before the class starts and seven days after the course starts to obtain their permit. By law, if they do not have their permit after the seven days, um, they will be asked to either switch classes, change classes, um, and we will go from there. For this particular semester, our first day of class is December 5th, which means that we could obtain our permits now and then we can obtain them all the way up to until February 12th. OK, so that is our deadline to make sure that we have our permit completed by February 12th. The earlier we get on this, the better the DOL is closed on particular days. You can get your permit online, but there are many steps that have to get followed and there's some government documents that have to be found, which can take some time for families. There's an email that was sent to your Skyward Parent Square. Um, and so if you have had that email, you figured it out on your own. Congratulations. I know navigating the DOL website is not easy. Um, the three of us, we get to navigate the DOL website all the time. So what seems common to us isn't always common because um, we know that working with the DOL is not always easy, although they have been making good strides to make it easier with the online process. And um, with getting a permit, they're going to want to talk to parent, guardian, whoever is associated with the minor or the minor themselves. Uh, there's many times that I'm helping students obtain their permit. They can come to me. Um, I can call the DOL with them if the time permits, um, but the DOL will only want to talk to the student. I'll just be there to support them and guide them. If they ask them a question that they're unsure of what the answer is, I can help them navigate that process. Um, we have a staff that also can help them with that process. And so if you get stuck, you cannot get through to the DOL, DOL, cannot figure out what is supposed to be getting done or what the next step is, please just reach out. The earlier you reach out, the better so we can help assist you in this process. First step is going to the DOL website. Um, there's going to be a drop down that says driver's license and permits. The DOL likes to change their website every once in a while, but this is the most common way that it has been looking. Uh, there is a part of it that is called License Express, which if you go into that first tab, you'll find License Express. It's also at the very top because this is how you access your driver's license and driver's license information. Adults can access their driver's license information through License Express as well. And so each student will have to set up their own account. Uh, you cannot be on an account with an adult. Uh, each individual driver's license holder in the state of Washington has their own License Express account. Once you find it, it'll ask you to join now. When you join now, you're going to pre-apply. This is where you put in all your per personal information to the DOL. Uh, it's a secured site, so name, date of birth, social security number, all of those things. If you have a state ID card, um, some families get a state ID card before they get a permit. If you have a state ID card, that student would already have a License Express account. And most of the time, it's just remembering what is that login for the student's uh, state ID card because your pre-application and your state ID card is going to have what is their permit number. OK, when it's a state ID card, it's not necessarily a permit number. Um, but after tonight or the next couple of days, when you get your permit, you'll have a permit number. So if you finish the pre-application process, 
when you get done and you go back to license express you look at their account there will be a wdl number that is underneath their name okay all of us as an adults if we have a driver's license you also have a wdl number unless you have not renewed your license in the last um four or five years you might still be on the old system where your driver's license starts with the first five letters of your last name and then the pattern of how that license number is was pretty easy to guess that's why they've switched over to this wdl number it used to be the first five letters of your last name the first letter of your first name first letter of your initial if you don't have those uh, you would get a star they would take the number 100 subtract the year that you were born so if you were born in 1990 100 minus 90 then you would have the digit 10 in your driver's license number and so they went away from that system because if i knew your name and knew what year you were born um, i could guess your license number pretty easily and so once you get that permit number we have to electronically enter this waiver if you just walk into the dol and say hey i'm here for a permit they're going to say um, we don't have a waiver on file you need to go to your school and make sure you get a waiver so the pre-application puts you in the system gets a wdl number that's your id number for the state so they know this is derek Hahn. and then that number gets sent to bps.tsc at bellinghamschools.org our administration will look at it make sure that you're enrolled in traffic safety make sure you are 15. once they have approved that they will send you an email saying yes your waiver has been completed you are in the dol system now you can go get your permit if you have not heard back from the bellingham public schools traffic safety email uh, there is no waiver and there is no need to go to the dol because it will just be a wasted trip to cordata so you get that confirmation once you get that confirmation, you've got two options. One, you can log back to License Express. This is probably what 80% or more of my students do. They log into License Express right underneath their name. There's going to be a get a permit number. You fill out a little bit more information. I think it's the Guardian's driver's license and something else. And you pay your $25 permit fee. After you pay your fee, there'll be a document that you can print a temporary permit. You can print that. You can drive with that. Um, and then the plastic permit will come to the mailing ad address 10 days or so after the permit has been processed. If you do not want to get your permit online, you really want to have a picture on your permit, then you must go to the DOL on Cordata. Um, the online version of the permit does not have a picture on it, but because it's a permit, you're only going to have it for six months or a year at most typically having a picture on your permit is usually not the most important thing to many people and so they just get their picture put on when they get their driver's license because to get your first driver's license that's when you have to go to the dol so this online option has been opened up since uh 2020 and so a lot of people are taking advantage of it because if we can save a trip to cordata we can do this at nine o'clock at night when students and families are free or whenever that is for you that would be um a great idea and this is what it will look like on the deal website again license express might move things around a little bit but there'll be a button that says get your instruction permit and if it says get instruction permit you know that that waiver has been entered and you have that opportunity so getting that permit is super essential if we have not yet obtained this permit by the time we have been watching this video um, that is number one on the to-do list for you as students right when we come to the first day of class hopefully we have that permit because seven days after class starts um, comes up really quickly especially if you're planning on going to the dol dol is typically closed on sundays they're typically closed on mondays if there's a holiday sometimes they will be closed on saturday and tuesday and so you really want to make sure that permit is taken care of of as soon as possible if you have general questions about the permit process the do website is a great place to go if you need your waiver entered again it's bps bellingham public schools dot tsc at bellingham schools dot org and then if you have any special issues uh, please reach out to your instructor so again kurt autumn at squalicum brie ammerman at bellingham and options and Derek Hahn at Seahome. And so we're going to get into the coursework. So permits, super important, but coursework, um, 
driver's ed, traffic safety has a lot of laws that are unique to traffic safety because the state realizes that this is a very serious endeavor to take part in. Um, annually, we have about 535 people who are killed on Washington state roadways. And so they don't want just anybody getting a driver's license. They want to make sure that you're safe, you're responsible, you're attentive in class, that you're coming to class. Um, if you miss the day about roundabouts, then are we going to be able to safely go through a roundabout, right? The state wants to verify that you're going to be able to safely do everything on the roadway. Whereas if you miss your day in a social studies class, that can be made up in many different ways. Or sometimes, right, what you talk about that day might not be essential or might not be a life and death type of situation. We usually don't get into too much doom and gloom. We kind of focus on low risk driving habits and the safest practices, but there are a lot of hazards associated with driving. And so we're going to go through some nuts and bolts of how this class operates, how this might be a little bit different than a traditional um, class that they're taking at their high school. And so first off is there's 1800 classroom minutes. By law, we must have 30 hours of classroom time. If more classes missed, students cannot receive credit for traffic safety. Um, in the given semester, there are typically about 32 and a half hours that they'll spend in traffic safety or so. And so if multiple absences start piling up, the likelihood of passing traffic safety goes down greatly. We'll have opportunities to uh, make up some classes, but there also is a state law that there's only so many hours of makeup classes do. Every school site will do this a little bit differently, and so your instructor will be um, in contact with your students that first day of class. We'll talk about what class looks like and just the importance of traffic safety. And so if you know that traffic safety falls during this time, making sure to not schedule counseling appointments, doctor's appointments as best we can, um, because any absence is an absence regardless of the reason. Um, the state doesn't honestly care what the reasons are. Obviously, there are some reasons that us as classroom teachers are like, yes, that is a very good reason to be absent. But again, we have to hold to the 30 hours of classroom time. Each student will spend six hours of driving behind the wheel with an instructor. When they show up to these drives, they must have their physical copy of a permit. Um, that is a state law. Anytime you drive a car, you must have a physical copy. You cannot have a picture of your driver's license and uh, count. Um, a lot of officers will be okay with that, even though um, it does say that you have to have a physical copy. And so as part of traffic safety, we're going to make sure that we follow the law to the law, which means that you have to have a physical copy of your permit. Every time that we do a drive, the student will drive for an hour. They will also observe their partner for an hour. So they drive for six hours. They observe for six hours. Um, when we do a traffic safety drive, there will be two people in the car besides the instructor. So two students, one driving, one observing. And so this brings us to not showing up for a drive. Students will sign up for drives. Classroom teachers will instruct them on how to sign up for their drives. We'll talk about it a little bit as well but when they sign up for a drive that is them committing to show up to that drive because if my drive partner is brie brie does not show up i cannot go do a drive solo with my instructor i need brie to be in the back seat for me to be able to do my drive and brie needs me in the back seat for her to be able to do her drive and so it is so important to show up for your drive if you've scheduled it out a couple weeks and then you realize, oh, shoot, that's grandma and Nana's birthday. I need to cancel that. Making sure that I'll let your instructor know as early as possible. Um, if we don't have 24 hours notice, uh, we'll count that as a no show. And if those start to accumulate or pile up, we might ask you to try set traffic safety at a different time um, when we can be more responsible with our schedule. And so the structure of the course. A concept is introduced in the classroom. Take roundabouts for an example. We'll talk about roundabouts. We'll have a quiz or a test about roundabouts. And then in that drive sequence, we will do roundabouts. OK, so we will always talk about whatever skill we are working on in the classroom before we apply it to the car. And then once we get out of traffic safety behind the car, then that is where hopefully they're going home and practice in that. Um, in state law, it says it has to be sequential and integrated, which all that means is just a fancy word of saying, learn about it, do it, and then keep practicing it. So 
the way that traffic safety is designed is that it all happens together, that it's not that we learn about traffic safety in the month of November, and then we don't drive a car until June, right? If we're learning about traffic safety, in November, we're driving cars in November, December, January, right? It should all be together. When we look at this course standards, again, we were talking about the 30 hours. That usually means that we can have no more than three absences. If we have more than three absences, the likelihood of being able to get our traffic safety hours in is very low. Um, we can only make up about four hours of classroom time. Um, if if we don't show up to drives, that has a really negative impact on their classmates, also has a negative impact on the instructors because they have shown up to do this drive and then the people have not shown up so they're unable to work. The class is all performance based. Um, we will take tests, we'll take quizzes. Um, everything in this class has to be passed at 80% or higher. If they do not pass on their first attempt, they keep doing it until they pass at an 80%. OK, so everything traffic safety related, 80 percent is the minimum. And then we will go from there up. If they get higher than 80 percent, that is fantastic. If they're right on 80 percent and they want to try to do better, that is fantastic as well, because driving is such a important piece. When we get into Skyward and what does that look like for the school? Our class is combined with financial education. Each school site will do it a little bit differently, but what it typically looks like is they will spend one day in traffic safety. They'll spend the following day in financial education, and each of those teachers will um, communicate with your students which class they're attending. The nice thing about that, which most of us instructors have figured out, is that if a student is gone for traffic safety, um, they will just forego their day that they're in financial education so they can show up to traffic safety because traffic safety is the one that requires 30 hours of classroom time. If they have more than a couple absences in financial education, that doesn't have the same state law requirements that traffic safety does. Obviously, any absence is going to um, hinder the performance of a student in a classroom, but traffic safety has this law. So if we're doing lesson one on Tuesday and Thursday, they're absent Tuesday. They could come to class on Thursday. They're still doing lesson one. They're just doing lesson one with the other half of their class, um, but they're still there for that coursework. And so that would not be an absence. So this takes some communication. This also takes some responsibility of the student knowing, hey, I'm going to be gone. I need to make sure that I'm attending the class that I need to attend, which typically works out pretty well when we just show up to school each and every day. When our grades go into Skyward, that is strictly just the classroom performance. A student in Skyward could be passing traffic safety and financial education, but if they do not do their drives, they will not get a pass from the DOL. The DOL has very strict guidelines of what it takes to pass, and so that is communicated with students. What gets reported in Skyward is the classroom component um, because sometimes the drives will linger linger a little bit after the end of the semester, but typically not too far. Because again, if we're learning about traffic safety in November, we should be driving in November as well. The car structure, instructors will instruct them on concepts that have been taught to them in class. They do six drives in total. Those six drives do not count as their 50 hours of practice. Those six drives are their traffic safety drives. The 50 hours of practice comes outside of class. Um, when we're instructing adults, this could be helpful for you as well. Uh, we want to make sure to give where then what directions. Um, giving them where directions first helps them identify what they are looking at. Um, so at the next corner, turn left. Um, that just allows them to process all the things that they need to think about before they make that left turn. Whereas if I say turn left, um, they might pull into a driveway. They might turn into an alleyway. Sometimes you get unique situations and they just start turning left because that's what you told them to do um, and there might not be a driveway or an alleyway there as well um, if you're asking them to turn left they might forget about the fact that they need to yield to oncoming because all they're thinking is turn left turn left turn left whereas if you give them the where they can scan that situation they can figure out what is needed to be done before that action of turning left students you are the legal driver of the car um, if we ever got pulled over in a traffic safety 
drive, they would want to talk to the student. They would probably be untoo happy with the instructor as well. Um, our traffic safety cars don't get pulled over because we're there to guide you to make sure that you stay safe, which is the same thing. Whoever you're driving with, aunt, uncle, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, right? Whoever you're driving with as you're on your permit, they're there for the same thing, right? They're there to keep you safe. They're there to keep you legal. Um, and when we are doing that as instructors and as families, right, we want to make sure that we provide verbal support, potentially physical support at times, maybe you might have to grab the wheel. Us as instructors, we have brakes in our cars on our side. So if um, there is something that we need to stop for, we can stop the car if needed. But really, if we communicate early, we communicate calmly, we communicate clearly, that can really help keep students at ease and um, get through complex tasks of driving. Another thing that can be helpful, and students will learn about this in class, it's a technique called commentary driving. It really helps put parents at ease or families at ease when your student is driving. It's just having your student talk about what hazards they see. Um, for us as instructors, it's really easy to feel subtle changes in the car of speed and whatnot. We spend a lot of time watching 15 year olds drive. And so there's a lot of things that we can see early and we can communicate early with that adults might not always be able to communicate as early or as calmly. And so we want to just make sure that, you know, students, if you can talk about, I see the pedestrian ahead and I'm going to take my foot off the gas to start to slow down. And as I get closer, I might have to apply the brake because we um, need to stop for that pedestrian in the crosswalk or not in the crosswalk, right? Anytime we drive, we have to do everything in our power to avoid a collision. Um, squeezing the brakes. You don't have to pump the brakes anymore. Pretty much every car has ABS. Us that are older might remember a time where ABS was not standard. Um, that's just a kind of instruction piece that, you know, we just hold the brakes. The brakes system will work. And then really the best thing to think about is the course does not start or end with just traffic safety, right? Once a license obtained, hopefully these habits that we talk about in class and making sure that we are safe um, are maintained for a lifetime. When we think about what does it mean to go simple to complex, how does the classroom build to the car build to what does that look like on our actual roadways? On drive one, it's just about basic controls, which if you get time to practice in a parking lot before drive one you get out on the roads before drive one any practice is always great practice we just want to make sure that you feel safe you're rolling working simple to complex that you're not getting into a complex situation that you might not be ready to handle okay when parents adults families go out and practice on with their own children whatever they choose to do for practice is fantastic any driving time is driving time we're, we're going to give you what our practice looks like, what our six drives look like, so that if you're thinking, oh, what would be a good idea to practice because it's been a while since you've gotten your driver's license, that's perfectly fine. So drive one, smooth start, smooth stop, smooth turns, left, right, stop signs, maybe a traffic light here and there on drive one. We'll work on backing straight. We'll work on tracking, making sure that we stay in the center of our lane. Drive two will get a little bit more complex. We'll be in a small residential. We'll probably hit a few traffic lights. We probably will get up to the speed of 35 or so. We'll work on backing around a corner, which is a skill on the state test. We will work on parking on a hill, which is a skill on the state test. We'll work on angle parking and we'll continue to work on smooth start, smooth stops, and really just making sure that we feel more comfortable at intersections knowing who has the right of way. Drive three, traffic lights galore. We will go through many traffic lights. We'll be on main roads, 35 plus. We will parallel park, which again is on the state drive test. We'll make lane changes. We'll make a U-turn. We'll make a Y-turn. Um, it's mainly main roads, working with speed and space. What do we do when we're on a 35 mile an hour road and a city bus pulls over to the side? What do we do when we're on a 50 mile an hour country road? There's a bicyclist that does not have a bike lane. How do we interact with that space management? How do we control our speed for the space that we are given? And if we cannot create the space that we need for a given situation, how do we reduce that speed? And what does that reduction of speed look like? Drive four, we get on the freeway. Some people might feel that's a little early compared to the city driving, where city driving is 25. But for many of us, we know that once we get comfortable with the on and off ramp of the freeway, the freeway usually 
is a nice place to drive. It's wide open. We get a good following distance. We keep a consistent speed. The number of hazards goes down a little bit on the freeway, although collisions on the freeway tend to be a little bit more severe because of the speed in which cars are traveling. Um, but because we can allow that speed and space, um, we'll also get into some roundabouts, especially for us on the Seahome side of town, even Bellingham side of town sometimes, right? The roundabouts are more on the north end by Northwest and Cordata. And so if we get up there on drive four, which we will, um, we will get our roundabouts in. Drive five is city driving, working with traffic, working with lanes, making sure we make safe choices, legal choices, knowing that we can turn left on red as long as we're going to a one way and it is clear, making sure that we look out for pedestrians, bicyclists, buses. Downtown on any given day has very complex driving situations. There's multiple lanes, there's lanes that um, come together, there's bike lanes that cross over driving lanes, um, there's one ways that turn into, or there's two ways that turn into one ways, um, there's a one way that turns into a two way, and so it's downtown drive five is one of the last drives that we do because there is so much complex tasks there. Drive six is a destination drive. Um, this is a chance for students to show that they have internalized, they've built good habits. Um, we will ask them to safely and legally get to somewhere in the city of Bellingham. The goal is for them to drive safely and legally if they don't arrive at their destination. That's not really the main piece of it. We just want to make sure that they can get there safely without getting told when and where to turn. So from Seahome, a lot of times we'll go to like Berkeley or the hospital, Cornwall Park, just somewhere in Bellingham that is major. So as they get close to Berkeley, things start looking familiar. They have to figure out which lane to I want to be in? Is it safe to lane change? What should I do at the traffic light? Am I thinking a couple blocks ahead? Right. All of those things, all those good, safe habits that we want them to have. We want to make sure that they're there on drive six. Drive six will also do a mock state exam. So the skills test, something they have to do to get their driver's license. We will parallel park. We'll back around a corner. We'll lane change. We'll park on a hill. We'll score it very similar to how the state exam goes. So a student will leave that final drive knowing, hey, if I drive like this and continue to drive like this and work on these few things, passing that state exam is not going to be a barrier for them to get their driver's license. OK, and so just as a quick point of learning in class, this is something that all of us as instructors will talk about is reference points. Parents, when you come from the first few days of class, if you have your students talk to you about reference points, it can be very helpful. Um, it just opens up a dialogue of communication. Um, you might learn some things, you might have some questions about things, and if your student has those answers or brings those questions to class, that is always fantastic. Um, that communication back and forth and your student sometimes as an adult is not the easiest, but a student saying, hey, you know you're not supposed to do that that means that they're learning in class and that is a really good thing if they're being observant of other people's driving and so one thing that we all talk about is when we get in the car what does that look like how do we adjust everything and so we have a list of five things here um, so when we get in the car we close and lock the doors we put the key in the ignition we adjust our seat adjust our steering wheel adjust our headrest adjust our mirrors and put on our seatbelts and ensure that other people do the exact same thing, okay? In many of us adults, this order happens as it happens, okay? And as an adult, I'm not here to try and influence how you're going to do this, but we feel that this order is one of the best ways of doing it. There's only one that we have a slight debate on, but first is first. This is the order that we would do it. Uh, closing and locking our doors. Closed door, locked door, uh, keeps the people inside the car that you want inside the car, keeps the people outside of your car that you want outside of your car. In a collision situation, if the doors are not locked, it's very easy for those doors to pop open. A lot of cars and a lot of audio manufacturers have realized people forget to lock their doors. And so most cars, once you start going about 12 to 15 miles an hour, the doors lock automatically. That is a safety feature. So your door does not come open when you are involved in a collision. Key in the ignition is just to get the key out of the student's hands, okay? We give the key to the student, 
then they need to adjust their seat. They need to adjust their steering wheel. Having a key in their hand is not going to be very helpful. Now, when we drive the same car every single day, where that key goes just becomes commonplace, right? If it's a proximity key and we just keep it in our pocket, that is perfectly fine. But we want our hands to be free so we can adjust the seat. We can adjust the steering wheel. We can adjust the head restraint and we have to make all those adjustments before we move the mirrors, because if we move our seat after we've adjusted the mirrors, we got to adjust our mirrors again. The last thing we do is adjust our seatbelt. If my partner is six, seven, I'm going to have to move my seat up a little bit. Right. And if I have my seatbelt on, I'm going to be fighting the seatbelt as I move it up. That's why we like to put it on last. Um, Again, if adjusting our seat is not something we need to do because we drive the same car every day, right? We're just going to close and lock the doors, make sure our keys are somewhere safe, make sure the mirrors are still set up for us. We put our seatbelt on, check to make sure everyone else has their seatbelt on, and away we go. But as we're driving a car that is not ours, we're getting into um, a traffic safety car. Someone else has driven it before me, right? All of those things get changed every single day, okay? And so the importance of traffic safety and the importance of why we do what we do is to build habits that are the lowest risk because um, driving is still the number one cause of death for teens, traffic collisions. Um, in the United States, traffic fatalities hover around 43,000. Um, that is up in 21, 2021. It has continued to have gone up in 2022. Um, 2023, it's been pretty stable. And so when we think about traffic collisions, there are a lot of things that go into that. There are three main types of distractions, visual, manual, and or cognitive. And so as we become safe and licensed drivers, and we want to make sure that we are avoiding this potential hazard. Um, for the Whatcom County, this is our traffic data. Um, in yellow, you can see our serious injury collisions, and in red, you can see our fatalities. Um, we had a slight dip in fatalities in 2020. We also know that there were not as many people driving in the year 2020, but our numbers hover about the same spot since 2013 all the way up to 2023. I don't have 2022 and 2023 data um, currently, but um, they've stayed pretty consistent for the county. And so it is the number one cause of death, but it is 100% uh, preventable. For teens, about 75% of their collisions do not involve alcohol, which is fantastic. Um, students and teen drivers um, choosing not to drink and drive. There's also a lot of alternatives to driving if intoxicated. Um, and so that is something that is fantastic. Uh, not as great. 50% of these deaths would not have been deaths if passengers were wearing their seatbelt properly. That means that the ch chest strap is across the chest, is not tucked behind an arm, it is not twisted, it is not um, anywhere else. And about 50% of the teens that are killed are killed because they were riding as a passenger with another teen, which is why the state has restrictions on teens with new licenses that they cannot have passengers um, that are not their immediate family for the first six months. After their first six months, there are still more restrictions because the state knows and recognizes this is a very dangerous time for teenagers to be driving a car by themselves um, for that. Uh, when you put one extra passenger in the car that is under the age of 21, the likelihood of a collision for that teenager increases by about 44 percent if you put two passengers under the age of 21 with that teen driver then you have about a double the chance of uh, getting into a collision and when they are carrying three or more teenage passengers or under 21 that risk of a collision quadruples the craziest statistic as i was going through traffic safety is if there's an adult in the car with a teen driver, that is actually the safest group of people on the road. Your likelihood of getting in a crash is decreased by 62% of all drivers. So if you take a average 30 year old, and you take a teenager with an adult in the car next to them, that teenager with an adult next to them, even though they don't have as much experience 
in the vehicle than the 30 year old, they are less likely get to get into a crash. And that's because the teen is paying attention to what they're doing. They know they have to pay attention to what they're doing because the adult is helping them pay attention to what they're doing and having two sets of people looking at the road identifying problems, solving hazards together makes for a safe situation. And so as teens are practicing, that adult in the front seat is super important to help guide what decisions they make for their lifetime in driving. Next step we're going to talk about is making sure that your teen is ready. Um, how will I know if my teen is ready to get their license? Do all Americans get their license at 16 years old? That is a no, right? Some people take a little bit more time. Some people don't want to drive right now, okay? Um, back when I was in high school, that was the thing, is you wanted to get your license on your 16th birthday. There are a lot of things you can do without a driver's license. Is it something that is um, very much needed in a lot of places? Yes, but you can get around without a license, especially in a city like Bellingham. We have good bike lanes. We have good transit. Uh, driver's license isn't necessarily always a need to have, um, but it is a privilege. It is an opportunity. You are earning a driver's license, right? There are steps that you have to go, go through when you're under 18. That is traffic safety. That is passing your knowledge test. That is passing your skills test, right? There are all these steps that we have to follow to make sure that we are ready for a driver's license. Parents, you might be thinking, okay, what are some things that we can look for? And teens, you might be kind of thinking about, okay, well, how do I prove to my parents that I am going to be safe? I'm going to be um, ready for this driving. So following rules, making sound decisions, resisting distractions, um, you know, all those things. I'll let you read the other ones. But really, you want to make sure, are they going to do what they say they're going to do? And are they going to keep to what they say they're going to do? Because once they have the keys to the car and they're on their own, they're making decisions on their own, right? And we can't make trust that they're going to make a sound decision on their own. Then we probably don't want them behind a 2,500 plus pound vehicle that can travel upwards of 60 to 70 miles an hour in the near Bellingham areas um, with the car. OK, and so if you're able to check off yes to all of those, your teen is probably not a teen, right? They're an adult. And so when we think about that list, we want to make sure that we are still giving them guidance, right? My dad was a traffic safety instructor. I've been around traffic safety since I was 12. And so I grew up with this and there was an early conversation in our family. And even after I got my driver's license, safe driving was still a conversation in our family. Just because I had my license and there was state laws, we also had family rules. And there are family rules that had to be followed. I grew up in Lake Stevens. Um, any of you that are familiar with the Lake Stevens Everett area, we have a road that is called the Trussell Highway 2 that goes across to Everett to then I-5. My first six months of driving even though as a licensed driver, I could drive on that road, that was a road that I was not allowed to drive on. Um, that was just a family rule. There were far too many collisions on that road at the time. It was not a great road. Some of the on-ramps were not fantastic in that area of I-5. And so that was a family rule that we had and we followed. And, you know, there was other ways to get into Everett if I needed to get into Everett. But as a 16 year old, there wasn't a lot of things that I needed to do outside of Lake Stevens other than go to soccer tennis practice. And so that's where I went. When we think about driving, we think about two things, right? There is the physical aspect of driving and there is a mental out task of driving. When we think about it physically, there's not a lot we can do in adults you're probably on the same page, right? We can make the car go faster. We can make it slow down um, in a variety of ways, right? Slow, slow down quickly by slamming on our brakes. We can also speed up quickly um, by slamming on our gas pedal. But we, we speed up, we slow down, we stop, we drive in reverse. We go straight, we turn left, we turn right. Other than that, there's not much else we can do with a car. We are not flying in three dimensions yet, um, nor hopefully we get there because we have a hard time on the flat roads. Well, let's not add flying in yet. But most of what we do in driving is 100% mental. And us as adults, that mental task we've done so many times, we have so much experience. Um, when we see someone starting to walk to the road, even if they're not in a crosswalk, we're already aware, yeah, that person's probably going to cross the street. And, you know, they might not look left or right before they cross the street, but I'm still going to not hit them. 
Okay. And so when we think about driving, it's that mental piece. And that's the piece that for teens takes time to develop because we get into this idea of, well, this is what the rule is, which is true. And we want to make sure that we follow the rules, but that pedestrian not crossing the street at a crosswalk, we still have to save human life. And we can't just go out and hit things because they're not following the letter of the law, right? We have to make sure that we do everything in our power to avoid a collision regardless of the reason. And so we want to make sure that we're doing that because when we think about a collision, we think about what is the most common statement is, well, I didn't see it. Okay. So this is a hundred percent a mental task, right? And there's two main rules in traffic safety that we'll follow. And if we follow these two main rules, the likelihood of a collision is extremely low. One, we always look in the direction that we're going. If we're looking in the direction that we're going, the likelihood of I didn't see it goes down greatly, okay? Because if I'm looking forward and I'm walking forward, do I run into a wall? Not very often, okay? The other one, some of you might have had answer number B is most common excuse, I couldn't stop in time. Well, if we never go faster than our ability to safely stop, rule number two, the likelihood of this coming up is pretty low. So if we're always looking in the direction that we're going and we're always sa able to safely stop in the distance that we're following something or to a traffic light stop sign, the likelihood of us getting hitting something is pretty low. Now, could we get hit by someone else driving unsafe? Absolutely, right? But if we lower our risk as a driver, the likelihood of us getting hit by other drivers is reduced as well, okay? This is always a great one, is when did we first learn how to drive? This started as soon as they were able to face forward, essentially, in their car seat, right? As adolescents, Driving is always part of our life, typically, and that is something that is always observed. Like I said, I grew up in a family where my dad was a traffic safety instructor. I was very aware of driving at a very early age. My grandpa also had a farm, which if you were in the farm fields on a tractor, as long as you could work the pedals and as long as you knew how the farm equipment behind you operated, you could drive that tractor. So I was at an early age driving farm trucks, um, learning about driving, watching my dad prepare videos, PowerPoints, all their fun stuff for traffic safety. And so at a very early age, I was trained in a traffic safety sense. All of your students at a very early age are watching you. About 80% of their driving habits come from you. And if you're thinking to yourself, some of my driving habits are not the greatest, that's okay. Now is a great time to adjust them. Okay. And as as student learns and as you are helping them alongside, um, if you become a safer driver in the process of your student becoming a safer driver, that is fantastic. OK, but I'm not here to teach adult traffic safety. Um, I'm going to make sure that your student is a safe driver. If you become a safer driver on the way, that is fantastic. There's been many parents that they have come to me after traffic safety and they're like, oh, my son comes home and tells me that I do this all the time and I've stopped doing it. Usually my response is fantastic. I'm glad that your son is paying attention in class and is helping to make everybody safer in Bellingham. When we look at teens, the biggest difference for them is they perceive risk very differently than adult. They also tend to get an unrealistic confidence in their own driving ability. And when they have an unrealistic confidence in their own driving ability. They typically drive too fast, drive too close, and accept too small of gaps in traffic. When students get into collisions, it's typically for recreational purposes. They're driving at night. They're driving with other teens. Um, they rarely crash when under supervision. The two most common types of collisions for teens is they rear end somebody. Distraction is very high. Cell phones are a big cause of that radio, changing the channel, whatever that might look like, talking to the people in the car with them. They are distracted. They don't stop in time for something. The other one is really concerning as well is that it is a runoff the road collision and it's a single car. It's a car traveling too fast around a corner and they cannot keep their car on the road because of the speed at which they are at. Um, they're only involving themselves. They are not hitting another vehicle. They are physically just unable to keep their car on the road because they're driving too fast. They're driving too close. They swerve to miss something because they cannot stop in the time that they are following in.
Teen Family Partnership. This class, this involves all of us. The ultimate goal is to make sure that we produce safe, responsible drivers, right? This is very important to you. This is your family member. You want to make sure that they are safe, responsible. We as classroom teachers also want to make sure that they're safe, responsible. We want to make sure that they're collision-free and citation-free. But we can do a lot of things that um, can avoid a citation, uh, right? We don't see a cop every single time we drive and so we want to make sure that that's safe and responsible is something that we are preaching every day when we drive a car um, together we can accomplish more than we can individually so teens paying attention in class us as teachers making sure that they are aware of what needs to get done making sure that they're aware of what is safe and families just making sure to continue to um, drive home that important information that we want to make sure that they are safe and responsible. When we look at that, families just provide that guidance. Students think, study, practice, get as much as you can. If there's anything that you ever are like, oh, I wonder what happens here. What do we do in this situation? That is fantastic. That means that you're learning, you're thinking about it, you're processing the information. Those are all things that we want to see out of a safe and responsible student. When we think about teaching, some of the things that we will teach is making sure that we establish a four second following distance, obeying post speed limit signs, checking our mirrors. Rear end collisions are really hard to avoid. And so if we're slowing down, a common phrase that your student might hear from their instructor is eye to mirror, foot to brake, right? So we're checking our rear zone, we're checking our rear view mirror, making sure that that car behind us is also slowing down. Our hands have moved away from 10 and two. Those of you that are like to keep their hands high, that is okay, I'm not gonna fix adult hands. But the reason we've moved away from 10 and two is if that airbag goes off, if you're up at 10 and two, both wrists have now been broken and your hands have been thrown back into your eye sockets. Where if your hands are a little bit lower, nine and three, they get pushed to the side. If they're at four and eight, uh, they get pushed down to the bottom. Um, it's just a little bit safer now that cars have airbags in the steering wheel. When we think about what does it build to habits, right? We're all about habits, making sure that this is a repeatable thing that we can continue to do time after time, that we are able to drive. And there's a lot of things that we don't have to think about because it's just something that we do because it's safe, if it's responsible, and it's just what we do. Something as simple as turning on our headlights. Every time we drive a car, we put our headlights on, even if it's not at night, because a car with lights is easier to see. It takes about eight times to start building something into long-term memory. That's why there's many things throughout this presentation that gets repeated a couple times because we're starting to build that long-term memory. For something to happen unconsciously, that takes us about 28 times. When we practice parallel parking, backing around a corner, we'll typically do it about three or four times. We'll ask the student to go home and practice and try to do it another three or four times. And so as they do that, they help to build that long-term memory. And if we parallel park perfectly 28 times in a row over the course of a couple months, then we probably will be able to continue to parallel park for the rest of our life. Are we gonna be perfect at it every time? Absolutely not, but we will be safe and responsible and legal. And if we can do those things, even if we're not perfect, that's okay. Many of us have probably driven downtown and we've seen someone take one or two attempts at their parallel park more than others and that's okay right if they're safe obviously the first time is the best time to parallel park but hey we all have to try again a couple times when we park in a parking spot okay the state is going for a goal of target zero this is a very attainable target right if our family has zero fatalities and every family next to us has zero fatalities and every family in bellingham has zero fatalities in it then we can get to this target Okay, right now we hover at about 535. That is way too many people that lose their lives because of decisions that are made on the roadway. So when we think about that, what does that look like? As we're growing up, as we're getting into this teen agreement, is when we become a licensed driver, how do we keep ourselves safe? What does that look like? What are some of those things that we talk about? What are some of those things that we make sure that are going to keep us safe? right? Risks, non-negotiable, clear consequences. Some of us might be a contract. It might just be a verbal. This is what we're going to do. This is how our family operates. You know, there's a lot of things that can be tracked, locations, speeds, 
Um, there's many different apps and every family will make a choice that is theirs. Cell phones were very new when I was becoming a teen driver and it was our family rule that when I got to a place that I was driving, if it was somewhere out of the ordinary, it wasn't just from home to school or from pr- home to soccer practice. If it was somewhere else, I had to call my parents to tell them that I got there and I had to tell them when I was leaving and when I got to the new location. Um, My wife and I, we share our location. She can look at my location at 345 and see that I'm still at school and know that I did not get in a crash on the way home. Okay. So some of these things are very simple. Other families will choose something. Every family will be different. And that is every family's choice. And teens, as you're thinking about what does it look like to be safe, responsible, you proving to your parents or your family that you are doing the right thing, that you're keeping to your word, that could be in the car, in the classroom, in your chores and responsibilities at home. That is all part of the idea of being safe and responsible, right? It's not just when you're in the car. It's everything that you do, if it's sports, animals, family, whatever that looks like would be something to do. As we think about the class, we think about driving family. The biggest class support is just committing to regular practice, um, trying to not get angry, realizing that they're learning as they're beginning to drive. They might not be able to mentally drive more than an hour, more than two hours. Um, Driving can be a very taxing thing when there's so many things that you're thinking about when a lot of the processes are not yet automatic, right? We will fill out drive cards after they finish their drive. So you'll be able to see the instructor's feedback. Students will also get the feedback and they can share it with you verbally if you would like them to do that instead of going into looking at their drive cards. Students show up to class. Again, most important, make sure to show up to your drive. Make sure to check your email, check Teams. If there's any changes, updates, we will do it through there. This is what a drive card would look like. So students and families, after they finish drive one, instructors will fill this out. They will give feedback. They'll talk about a couple things. Hey, continue to work on this. These are going to be your most important things to help continue this journey of driving safely and legally for a lifetime. Organ donation is something that we get to talk about by law. There's a YouTube video that I will attach. I will not spend a whole lot of time on this, but when you do get your permit, it'll ask you if you want to be an organ donor. It's the uh, easiest and simplest way for organ donation to happen in the state of Washington is on the driver's license application. Some new state laws, move over law. This one is not as new anymore. We know that if we see flashing lights on the right-hand side, we need to move over a lane if moving over a lane is possible. If moving over a lane is not possible, we need to significantly slow down if we're going to pass a police car, fire truck, ambulance, or tow truck next to them, which significantly slow down is usually about 15 to 20 miles an hour below what is the posted speed limit. Another law that has changed in the recent time, which most of us probably have not needed to worry about yet, is child seats. Um, Rear facing is much longer than it was when I was a child. Um, There's a nice little chart here. If you have children that are younger, it might be useful to know. And so as we're learning traffic safety, as we're learning to drive, laws update, they change, they adjust over time. And so once we leave traffic safety, it is our job as adults and responsible drivers is to make sure that we stay up to date on these laws. Two laws that have not yet changed, but they could change in the future. One failed last year. The state of Washington wants to make the drinking uh, legal limit to 0.05 instead of 0.08. It did not pass. Uh, The state of Utah had theirs passed to 0.05. That is one that they have worked on trying to change, but has not changed. If it changed, it would be the licensed drivers to make sure that they're aware of that change. The other change that will not impact any of you is it's a state law that they're proposing currently in 2024 is they've realized that the age of 18 to 25 is extremely dangerous. A lot of people are not taking traffic safety to get their license and they get their license at 18, but they've seen the negative effects of that, that. 18 to 25 year olds are really dangerous. There is a law on the table right now to make traffic safety required up to the age of 24. 
Is it going to pass? I have no idea. It would be highly unlikely to get it to pass because no other state, I think, is working on this right now. But the state of Washington realizes that age group is dangerous without traffic safety and they want to do something about it. And so as laws change, as they adapt, we want to make sure that we stay up to date with those. OK, if there's ever any questions, make sure to reach out to your instructor. If you're ever needing help with the permit process, the early stages of traffic safety, bps.tse at bellinghamschools.org. Um, again, follow up with your instructor, Kurt Autumn at Squalicum, Bree Ammerman at Bellingham and Options. And again, I'm Derek Hahn at Seom High School. Thank you again for watching this. The links for a couple of videos are going to be provided in the email. And again, if you have any questions, just make sure to reach out because again, safe driving starts in childhood and it is never ending. All of us as drivers can always make sure we are doing what is safe, what is responsible and what is best. Thank you.